Hey guys, I'm with Gene Devalia from Reef Labs here in Tampa, Florida. How you doing, Gene? Good, how are you? Good. So I'm here and you said you would tell me a little bit about what you guys do with the ICP test. So sure. I'm gonna just kind of ask you a question. I'm gonna shut up and get out of your way and let you answer. So Perfect. first, what is an ICP test? So ICP test is really a way of determining the elemental composition of the water in your, in your aquarium or your, your aquaculture system. Um, so we're looking at individual elements, uh, you know, like we have here on the periodic table as opposed to molecules or more complex things. Uh, these are the basic building blocks of, of life and they have a lot of, uh, lot of influence on the organisms in, in, your, uh, in your system and often in, in surprising ways, you know, as we've found out over, over time. <laughs> So, so what is the importance of an ICP test? Now we know what it is, but what, is, what makes an ICP test so important? So I would say that um, it's probably an underrated um, uh, value to ICP testing. And, and unfortunately, I think that's due to a lot of factors that um, uh, probably aren't true. Um, you know, uh, one of those in particular, I think, is, is and, and this is true with consumer-grade test kits, um, consistency is, is, is more important there than necessarily accuracy. And, and that's, that's no slight to any of the, the manufacturers of those test kits. It's just the method that's, that's involved there is, is prone to being influenced by a lot of factors. And it's, it's difficult for anybody, particularly not an experience, somebody who's experienced in laboratory practice to be able to replicate the test over again. ICP testing, on the other hand, is a, is a, is a highly accurate method of determining concentrations of, of these elements, anywhere from parts per millions to uh, parts per billions or even parts per trillions in, in, in some cases. So uh, those elements, of course, um, not only are they important to uh, coral and, um, and those invertebrate organisms, but they're also um, equally important to the microbiome that's present uh, in, in an aquarium. And that microbiome uh, is, is also something I believe is fairly underappreciated. Um, but if you look at some of the research that's come out of the scientific community in the last couple of years, it's, it's mostly open ocean research, but it's still very relevant to closed systems, is they're finding that that microbiome is far more important to the health and life cycles of uh, marine organisms than what was previously, uh, previously suspected. Um, for example, uh, most coral, as any, any reef is familiar with, has a, a you know a slimy uh, kind of mucosa that's uh, that uh, surrounds the, the fleshy part of the coral. Mm -hmm. um, that mucosa is where bacteria colonize, right, uh, in coral, and it's a it's a ready, a ready food source for uh, coral. They can actually um, absorb and digest those uh, those bacteria off the surface of coral. Um, so that mu mucosa is there for multiple reasons, but now they're understanding that uh, one of those purposes is actually the absorption of, of those elements. So coral can absorb some elements directly through the uh, water system, but through the water column, but um, it's often more efficient for them to uh, absorb bacteria because bacteria aggregate uh, minerals uh, more efficiently than a, a coral can, per se. Um, and we actually, uh, we actually tested that theory we did an analysis on uh, skimate from uh, our systems and also in concert with, uh, with work that we're doing with ACI Aquaculture. Okay. And uh, as this research was coming out, Chris Meckley and I were having conversations about it and, and we devised uh, the idea of, of uh, testing skimate to see if this is really true. And we did find very high concentrations of uh, many of the uh, trace elements that are typically associated with bacterial growth. Um, in, in those skimate samples. And although you may not be aware of it, skimate is um, often uh, primarily uh, bacterial in nature. Um, so it's, that's an, an overlooked um, uh, factor, but uh, bacteria actually have a slight electrical charge, which is why you hear about gram negative and gram positive, and that refers to whether they're negatively or positively charged. And when you introduce air into water and you've got a, a, you know, a surface there, a surface tension, right? That surface tension is actually electrostatic. That's what causes that. So it's a slight electrical charge. So in a skimmer, you've got lots of surface area of air mm -hmm. against water mm -hmm. in the form of tiny bubbles. So it's inevitable that you get um, bacteria caught up in those, um, those little bubbles that get you know, uh, pulled into your skimmate. And of course, there's also proteins and other things in there as well too that, that are also uh, charged molecules. Uh, proteins are in most cases what they call polar, meaning that they, they don't have a uniform charge, but they have uh, distinct um, irregularities in the charge. So proteins get attracted to that, that surface as well too. So admittedly, some of the bacteria that's in, in the uh, skimmate grows and multiplies in there, but it comes from uh, the water column and, and will get pulled in as well too. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a, a nice way to validate that, uh, that theory as well, too. So in, inside my skimmer, you know, mm -hmm. you, get that, you get that coat on the wall, you sure. know, the wall of the neck. Yep. So that, that's bacteria. That's bacteria. Yeah, one of the ways you can identify that is that uh, you'll notice that over time, uh, initially it starts out kind of smooth and uniform, but mm -hmm. as it accumulates, it gets kind of lumpy and, and it gets a texture to it. And that's because that's actually a colony of bacteria that's growing. And bacteria grow in, in um, very recognizable ways whereas proteins and films and, and uh, other types of inanimate deposits will just kind of layer uniformly. Bacteria will have regions of, of um, uh, enhanced growth but for a lot of different mechanisms. Bacteria have funny ways. They, they form what's called a quora, and uh, when a quora is, well, they, they grow more rapidly than uh, in other areas. So they're, they're See, interesting I, organisms. I was always told that was like fish poo. That's yeah. what I've read, I've heard, yeah. but it's it's, Mostly bacteria. Yeah, and, and actually, even even the argument about fish waste, um, a skimmer is only going to connect, uh, or excuse me, to attract um, polar molecules, right? So not all organic molecules have a charge. Uh, some do, and some don't. Um, and that's even the case for proteins. There are proteins that do and don't. So there are amino acids that do and don't. So there are a skimmer's only going to function with those particular types of uh, biological byproducts that have a, an electrical charge. So uh, fish waste is not all protein. I mean, there's a mixture of many things in there. There's bacteria in it. Um, there are phosphates in it, um, and of course, there's um, 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 fiber in it. Um, and so those elements you know, are going to break down. The ones that are that are that are polar, mostly the proteins, are going to get pulled in through the the skimmer, but a certain amount of it also is will, will never make it into the skimmer unless it happens to get caught in the, in the updraft. So really what, what it is is the bacteria breaks down the fish waste, eats the fish waste, if you yeah. will, and that gets brought into the skimmer. That gets brought into the skimmer, and of course there are some proteins. Um, you know, the fish have fairly inefficient digestive systems, so uh, there's a lot of still viable um, um, food matter that's in there in the form of proteins that are broken off from whatever you feed them. And those, those fragments, if they're polar, will get pulled in there as well, too. This, this sounds like a topic for a whole other video. It is, yeah. So uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe when you, uh, you, you guys get done doing all your testing of that stuff, yeah. we can come back and uh, get a little bit more information on that. Yeah, um, so. Earlier we were talking mm -hmm. and you said that the, uh, the, the ICP test is mm -hmm. mostly for salt water, you know, reef tanks. Sure. I'm assuming, you know, probably the vast majority of what you do. Sure. But what about uh, fresh water and what about RODI systems? Like if I want to have my RODI water tested. Sure. So we do test RODI water. Um, we, um, you know, when we develop the product, uh, one of the decisions that we had to make is do we, do we give you, we, we put two tubes in each, in each package. And part of that is for, um, you know, keeping the weight below a certain limit so that we can keep the kits affordable for the return postage and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, you could use that for an RO sample or you can have two salt samples. And after really thinking that process through, um, we decided not to provide uh, RODI testing with every kit uh, for, for two reasons. One is um, the kits do get damaged in the mail occasionally. Every once in a while we'll, we'll receive a tube mm -hmm. that's broken or that's leaked. And sometimes it's uh, something happens in transit. Sometimes it's because the cap wasn't run all the way. And having a second tube ensures that we can still process your, your test for you. The other reason is that um, the parameters in a saltwater system change quickly, particularly depending on, on how well stocked your, your system is and, mm -hmm. and the volume of the system. Um, so there's a, there's a need or a benefit to testing your saltwater much more frequently than, than there is testing your RODI system. R RODI filters change much slower than the <laughs> dynamics of the aquarium. So it didn't really make sense to be testing your, your, your RODI water with every, every test that you do on your system. Um, where but, I, but if I want to have it tested, I can send you it can to you. You can absolutely do it. Yeah, yeah that's good to know. Yeah. And what about freshwater tanks? Because I, you know, I'm Mr. I, I'm, sure. I'm Mr. Reef Safe, but <laughs> you know, for you freshwater guys out there, the people that do both, yeah. you know, can they get their water tested? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we we I mean, if you can send it to us and we'll test it, we won't turn it away. Um, but we we haven't optimized our test is optimized for saltwater systems. Okay. And we are talking with uh, um, the, the good folks at Reef Blueprint who, who produce excellent additives for uh, reef systems to, to find out what their take was on, on the, the um, growing interest in planted uh, systems again and whether they felt that um, there might be some uh, utility in having 
uh, test that's focused on uh, some of the micronutrients uh, that uh, plant systems uh, consume. As it turns out, there are. Um, there are some elements that uh, freshwater plants uh, need to, in particular, to maintain their coloration, their health, and growth. Uh, so it's something we're looking into and we're watching very closely how that market develops and if there's a way that we can add some value and, and bring a test to market, we, we definitely will. Oh, that's, that's really good to know. Freshwater guys, be on the watch out for that. <laughs> um, how often do you suggest getting your water tested through ICP? Like, in my Great opinion, question. Yeah. The, the way I like to do it, I send mine the first of every month, mm -hmm. and I like to have a database of what my tank is like when it's good, when it's mm -hmm. bad, when it's in between. Yeah. I like to have a, a basically a paper trail of sorts. Sure. So what is your suggestion on it for, you know, for someone that may not want to spend, what is it, $45 for a test? Sure. You know, mm -hmm. like every month. Sure. You know, for me, $10,000 aquarium, I want to have. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, it's a great question, and um, I'm glad you asked. So uh, a lot of it depends on what you're doing right in your system. So if you've got a, a, uh, a system where you spent years accumulating coral and, and they've grown into big colonies, I mean, you have a sizable investment of time, a sizable investment of money, and not to mention um, the pride of, you know, <laughs> 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 having gotten it to that point. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would view an ICP test as an insurance policy. Um, a lot can change in a, in a mature system with a lot of coral and it can change very quickly. Uh, and coral are, as, as we all know, they're, they're often not very forgiving or at least some of them are not. Um, so I, you know, I'd say $45 a month uh, is, is not much to pay to have an insurance policy against losing something that uh, you know, you've put all that time and money into. Um, if you're not, if you don't have a lot of expensive coral or you don't have, it's a new, new system and maybe things are doing okay, um, you know, maybe you can stretch it out to six weeks or, or eight weeks and, and, uh, and not worry too much. I certainly wouldn't suggest to anybody to let it go more than eight weeks because a lot can change in that period. So, so at the very least, every other month. At the very least, Because I would have thought month. quarterly, yeah. but, but every other month, yeah. I mean, six times a year, that's not too bad. Yeah, that's, that's the minimum I would suggest. And certainly if you've got a, a tank that you're, you know, you, you've coddled and, and made beautiful, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, even consider doing it uh, twice a month. I mean, if you really have a, a large system with a lot of valuable coral that you care about. Um, things can change very quickly and um, you know particularly um, with if you've got uh, and if you've got a bare bottom tank you don't have to worry about this so much but if you if you like a deep sand bed or if you've got a refugium and and you've got some uh, sand bed in there uh, one of the things that can happen is those sand beds uh, tend to over a period of time uh, accumulate uh, some of the um, yeah, contaminants and things you don't want in the system settle in, into those beds. You also have a bacterial population that grows in there that aggregates mm -hmm. um, those things over time. And if something happens to disturb that, um, you know, you can have an otherwise perfectly healthy tank that you regularly do your water changes and you do everything exactly the way you should, but if something happens to disturb that, um, sometimes you can, you know, you can have a a problem on your hands and not knowing exactly what it is, you may not know what to do to, to, to remediate it, right? Whereas uh, if you're doing tests like that regularly, you'll spot those things. Sometimes it can be a fish, you know, again, if you have a deep sand bed and, and you've got a fish that all of a sudden decides that he wants to uh, start rearranging things, <laughs> maybe he's doing it at night when you don't see it, um, you know, can no, no fish ever yeah, does no, that. No, no, never, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, those things can catch you off guard. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something you have to adjust to your tolerance and your budget uh, and, what you, and your goals. Um, another example is if you're trying to get every last bit of color and growth that you can get uh, out of your, your acros, um, I would consider doing it uh, more frequently. Uh, even tiny, tiny changes in the parts per billion range of some of the trace elements um, uh, can make uh, very noticeable differences in, in coloration in corals. Uh, so if you're really trying to squeeze that last bit out, um, you know, 40 bucks is, is kind of cheap for, for what you, you know, what you get out of that. I, I just got back from Reefapalooza and Aquashella mm -hmm. and, and Florida Frag Swap and, you know, I mean, I spent only a little bit of money. Honey, I just, just, just a little <laughs> bit. But, you know, I saw people there spending wads of cash on, you know, corals. I mean, you know, sure. there was one coral there, this guy next to me, mm -hmm. he spent $1,200 on a mm -hmm. single frag. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for someone like that, yes, they, they yeah. need to be doing these ICP tests Absolutely. on a regular basis. Yeah. And, and another way you can look at it too is, and uh, I'm sure I'm not going to make any of the many suppliers of additives out there very happy by saying this, but uh, 
Um, a lot of... Well, we'll cut this part out. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> just remove that part, but... Uh, so if you get any heat from it, you know, you know uh, <laughs> that a lot of uh, what's on the market right now is, uh, and, and in their defense, uh, in the absence of having any way to test and determine exactly what's wrong, um, some of these additives and medications and, and solutions do work, but they don't solve the problem. And uh, when you have available uh, ICP testing that's accurate and that, that you can get a, a reasonable turnaround on time-wise, you can save yourself some money. Um, you can really cut out a lot of the additives and, and things that you, you might be using to kind of deal with that persistent problem that you can keep under control but you just haven't been able to completely eliminate for years. Um, yeah, it might be worth it to take the time to find out exactly what it is and, and solve the, the root cause of it instead of having to rely upon um, additives. Uh, so it, it's, it's something to consider and, and you know we've routinely seen it um, with, with our customers. We love when, when, when our customers contact us and tell, tell us what they're experiencing or what they solved with an ICP test, but almost one for one uh, we've solved a lot, of, um, a lot of very common issues really just by addressing deficiencies or excesses in, in trace elements. You know, sometimes it's cyano, sometimes it's nuisance algae, um, even dinos, which uh, I hesitate to mention because I know <laughs> Flame Wars uh, gets started over these comments, but, um, but we have repeatedly uh, solved dinos with, with one very simple uh, observation, and that was that systems that have problems with dinos are iron deficient. And um, we have consistently, time over time over time over again, solved uh, dinos by adjusting iron. Um, the one caveat to that is, if you have other deficiencies, um, iron is, is happens to be an element that works in concert with uh, with zinc and, and a few other uh, molybdenum. elements. Um, molybdenum, we're not sure, maybe. Um, some of that is still out for debate, but uh, zinc for sure. Um, selenium is uh, another one that seems to have some play there. But uh, as long as those are in range, if you're just iron deficient uh, in the microns, then you can, you can dispatch the dynos uh, pretty, pretty quickly and pretty easily that way. Um, so if you've got a dyno problem, do an ICP test. Um, if you've got any traces that are, are uh, fix all those and, and your dyno problem is more than likely uh, going to disappear. Um, and again, of course, I'm not foolish enough to say that that solves every dyno um, uh, problem because there could be other factors. There's hundreds that, of strains of dyno. Know, yeah. yeah, there's lots of strains and uh, obviously uh, excesses of nutrients and other things can offset all this. But if you've got a well-balanced system, you don't have any oddities in other areas, um, most of those nuisance, persistence nuisances like that can be solved with uh, uh, with a trace element. You heard it here first. Dinos is no longer a problem. No, just kidding. <laughs> just don't kidding. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I dose iron because I have Ganapora, and sure. you know I've, I've been doing a lot of reading on it, and mm -hmm. says so. The ICP test to me is invaluable sure. to know what my iron levels are because I, I have not found a home test kit that mm -hmm. is reliable or repeatable. With yeah. when it comes to iron and some of the other trace elements. Yeah, and that's, that's just a limitation of the process. I mean, uh, those, those are calorimetric tests, and uh, when it comes to certain elements like that, you just can't um, manipulate the test in a way where um, with a home kit you can delineate the differences in concentrations well enough for it to be useful. Most of those kits, and, and again, it's not a... Uh, I'm not criticizing the kits. It's, uh, there's nothing wrong with what they're manufacturing. It's just that the process itself is just barely on the edge of being useful for um, you know, home testing. And usually they either tell you that your coral's going to die or <laughs> because there's not enough there or it's going to die because there's too much or maybe it's in the right area, but they don't give you a lot of, you know. When energy. it comes to the home test kits, what I find yeah. hardest is to repeat you know, it's it, to get the same, and I'm not even talking about the test kit results, I'm talking about doing, me doing the exact same thing every time, whether I shake right. it enough or long enough or, you know, whether I've added the right amount in, I never know whether the scoop should be a heaping scoop or a flat scoop, yeah, you know. That's right, very and, subjective. Uh, <laughs> you know, some of the tests don't even tell you, so I'm like, yeah. well, what do I do, you know? So, yeah, I, I can see, and to me, the ICP test just, levels the playing field because yeah. it's the same way every time done by someone like you that knows mm -hmm. what they're doing mm -hmm. and the results are going to be repeatable. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and that's that's really precision, right? Um, you know, when you when you talk about scientific measurements, um, the terms precision and accuracy come up uh, quite a bit. 
Um, and oftentimes in you know regular communication, people will will interchange those words, but they actually mean something very specific um, in a laboratory setting. Uh, and precision really refers to um, repeatability, right? Uh, and accuracy refers to how close it is to, to the truth, right? The actual value. Um, so in you know uh, in science, you know we never get to exactly the truth. There's always uh, you know factors that that influence it. Um, and of course, uh, having precision is really all about how repeatable your your, your process is. So uh, and in an ICP analysis, there are thousands of uh, parameters that can be adjusted. Um, that affect how the measurement is taken, um, including the number of times the measurement is repeated. Um, so what, probably what a lot of people don't realize is they think that your water gets tested once, but in actual fact we test it um, for quite a few times. Really? And then we calculate an average of, of those multiple tests. Uh, and then to determine whether or not that number meets our quality standards, um, we calculate what's called a standard deviation, which really just looks at the average of the values and how how far uh, apart are the are the deviations from that average, right? So are they all pretty close together, or are they spread out? So an the average itself doesn't tell you that; it just gives you a number. So what a standard deviation is a, is a statistical tool, and that tells you well were the numbers fairly close together, or were they really far apart, right? I mean, you know, the average of 25 and 75 is 50, and so is the average of of 48 and 52, <laughs> right? So, you know, the average, people think of averages, but there's really, you have to, you have to look at this also in terms of uh, whether we're the distributions of those measurements. So we take multiple measurements, um, more than five, and um, we combine those, we calculate an average, and then we, we look at what, the, uh, what that, that spread is of those numbers. And then we take that spread and we express that as, as, as a percentage of the measured value. So that way you can compare it, whether you're talking about a number that's 10,000 or a number that's, that's two. And uh, we generally like to keep those below 2%. Um, so that's a pretty tight, um, pretty tight group with, uh, with ICP analysis. So mm -hmm. we, we go to a lot of lengths to, uh, to really make sure that those numbers are meaningful and to make sure that um, you know, we're giving you something that's representative of, of you know, what's actually in your system. That, that is really cool. I, I mean, just just seeing your lab and and seeing what you do here and hearing about this stuff. I, I mean, I'm kind of floored by it. You know, you, you have these ideas in your head, and sure. you know, you think, oh, it's going to be like going into Willy Wonka. You know, <laughs> and it, it's it's a lab. It's sure. you know, it's it's sterile. It's it's clean. It's you, know, mm -hmm. you got all the vials. You know, nice and neat. It's mm -hmm. it's like what you see on a, on a CSI TV show. Yeah. Um, so it, it it to me. It's really cool seeing this and hearing the scientific talk, or probably probably the dumbed down scientific talk for me. <laughs> but you know, it, it's really cool hearing that. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, sure. the people that have not tried it, ICP mm -hmm. test, give, give them a reason why to try it for the first time. I think the most important thing to do is really to clearly define what your objective is. Um, and I think it's in this hobby, it's easy to to <laughs> to not do that, right? I mean, you go to you go to some of these shows, or you go to a, a, a you know your nice local fish store, and and you get blown away by the variety and the colors, and you know all the different shapes, and and it's very easy to to not take the, the time to sit and say, what what's my object? What's my goal, right? And I think that's the very first thing that you have to do is really take a step back for a moment and say, hey, what's my goal here? I mean, do I just want a really nice looking tank? Do I just want to keep fish? Do I want to, do I want to be that guy who's squeezing the every last bit of color and growth out of his acros? Or do you want to stick with LPS? I mean, um, and, and think about that, right? I mean, are you, are you going to, are you, you want to grow frags and sell them? I mean, are you going for fast growth? Or, um, you know, think about that and answer that question first. Then once you've answered that question, um, then say, okay, where am I at now compared to where I'd like to be? And identify what are the, what are the qualities of your system that aren't living up to your, your goal. And once you've done that, then do the ICP test and look and see, we, we have a, an area at the top of the results that tells you where you're, the things you should be concerned about. And it also identifies typically what those deficiencies or excesses might be producing in your in your system. Um, use that as a as sort of a set of priorities. Find the ones that match what are the biggest points that are missing from your current system that are far from your goal, and fix those first. 
Uh, don't try to fix them all at once. Um, you know, that can get very overwhelming and, <laughs> and you know, you change it too many at once. Just focus on, on the priorities. Once you've got those kind of shored up, do another test, see where you're at, uh, see what's left, and then focus on the next set of priorities, the next set of things that are, that are you know, too far away from your goal. And do this iteratively over a period of time. You know, it may take you three months, might take you six months. Don't rush it, um, but be very uh, specific and very focused and, and keep your goals in mind. That would be my recommendation for somebody who hasn't, you know, hasn't, hasn't done one yet. Because it can be very overwhelming you see all those numbers and all those elements. I mean, you know, people who you start out and you think, wow, I only need to worry about salinity, temperature, <laughs> pH, and alkalinity, and then all of a sudden now I've got 35 or, you know, or, or more uh, things I have to look at, and it can become overwhelming. But really it's not. Once you figure out what, um, every system is different, and you figure out, you know, what your consumption is on those items, it actually becomes pretty easy. And, and if you do this, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches because uh, you, you, you'll get that tank into uh, you know, cruise control mode a lot sooner. Yeah, a couple things I want to point out. Gene did not say on his first thing is do an ICP <laughs> test. He said two or three things before he even said to do an ICP test. It was not a sales pitch. Right. He was saying choose your goals first, which I think yeah. is really wise. And if you go to a local fish store or an online store and you ask the question and they say buy this, that should be a red flag. Listen to what they're saying. Gene here mm -hmm. wants to make sure that people succeed, and that's why he started the company. Right. Mm -hmm. And set your goals, set what your end goal will be, what you want, and then take the next step. So I think that yeah. that was really good hearing that. It shows that you that you care about the hobby and more yeah. than just the business. Yeah, you absolutely. Know. Yeah, that's why we're here. That's why we started. And there's no point in in doing all this if it's not uh, doesn't produce a real tangible benefit for our our customers and. That's what, we, that's what we get excited about. <laughs> if you had to pick, you know, like there's been a lot of mm -hmm. hot button uh, topic on pH lately. You know, mm -hmm. th that, that seems to be the, the, the catchphrase of sure. the year. You know, chase pH. And of course, mm -hmm. we've been told all our lives not to chase numbers. And now mm -hmm. we're being told chase the pH number. And, mm -hmm. and I would say, personally, I like to have my pH in a range yeah. of between uh, 0.02 and 0.05, that's mm -hmm. the range I shoot for. Sure. I'm yeah. not trying to peg it, so I don't think sure. I'm chasing it. But outside of pH, what do you think is the most important element or elements, and you know, what are the secondary ones? I, if I remember sure. correctly, the test has, has like the high priority ones and the next priorities. That's right, yeah. So, uh, you know, I would say, um, you know, I, well, for one, I do agree that pH is, is, is important. I mean, when we're, we're talking about chemistry here, I mean, in terms of biological chemistry, you're talking about these organisms u utilizing um, the elements that are present either in the bacteria they consume or, you know, in, in, uh, in the water column. Um, pH is the governor of how efficient that chemistry is. So in, in living organisms, um, the chemical reactions that take place that are part of metabolism, that are part of, you know, cell replication and all that only work within a narrow range of pH. Um, so if you've got an organism, uh, all organisms struggle to maintain the pH internally that is optimal for their particular biochemistry that they rely, on, rely upon. So if the outside environment deviates from it, that means the organism has to work harder to keep the pH internally in, in that range. It's the same for humans all the way down to bacteria. Um, so uh, really, I mean, what we're doing with ICP analysis and elemental composition is, is actually works hand in hand with trying to keep your pH within a, an optimal, um, optimal range. So apart from that, if you've done that, which is important to be able to get the maximum benefit out of this, um, boron is, is one to look at because boron actually uh, contributes to pH stability in marine systems. Uh, so if you've got a boron deficiency, you're going to find it harder to uh, track your, your pH. Uh, that's an important one. Um, iodine, also very critical because all organisms, all biological systems need iodine to some extent or another to maintain normal metabolism, and that one, that one gets overlooked a lot. Uh, potassium, also uh, very vital. I can't tell you the, the, the number of times <laughs> I've seen somebody's tank crash because their potassium was too low. Um, that's that one's uh, obviously very important. That's the first one I look for when when I open the test. I yeah. go right to potassium. That's right. Where's potassium? So I can't test for that one at yeah. home well, yeah. and I'm like, I, I need to know. So yeah, yeah. Um, zinc, um, iron. Um, if you've got uh, gonium pora, vanadium, 
um, manganese. Uh, manganese is another that's really important. You don't need it. You really actually only need manganese present in the parts per trillion, like uh, eight or nine hundred parts per trillion. Um, but um, it's really important if it's not there. Uh, that's uh, that, in my opinion, is the whole reason why gonies used to be called the six-month coral mm. um, was because there wasn't proper attention given to manganese and, and I also I'm vanadium also to a certain extent. Um, so I think those are the main ones. Um, then once you get beyond those, I mean, you want to look at cobalt, and chromium, um, nickel. Um, you want uh, strontium. Obviously, is is all. Most people don't have problems with strontium, but um, you want it's something you want to monitor. I want to throw a hardball question at you sure. right now. Sure. Yeah. What do I do if I don't have enough uranium in my tank? <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I guess then you 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 can rest assured that you don't live near Piney Point. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I, I heard that recently. Some someone said they were complaining because the ICP test came back with they had that yeah. low uranium. Yeah. And it you know and it said something about adding trace elements. I'm like yeah. like oh okay. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> definitely don't need any uranium. Um, we make that. Pretty clear, I think, in our results, which oddly enough, not you know, not all the results that you see out there emphasize that, but all, all the contaminant <laughs> items that have no value, we 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 pull those out separate, <laughs> so it's very clear. Yeah, <laughs> move closer to nuclear power plant. That's yeah, right. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Do. Or no. move to Piney Point. You know. <laughs> all right. All so right. Uh, I, I've asked you a bunch of questions. You know, you've you've answered my questions. Is there something you'd like to tell the viewers? You know, that that about ICP, about mm -hmm. what you guys do here. And this is your chance to, you, know, you, sure. got, you got the soapbox? And sure. And I would say probably the uh, number one thing I would encourage um, those, those of you that haven't tried ICP before to, to give it a try. You know, um, do what I said, define your goals and your objectives and assess where you're at. Uh, but I, you know, and, and I obviously there's no way I can say this and it not seem biased, but um, I'll step out of my, you know, my hat as, uh, you know, as, 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 as tester. Uh, and, and into my hat as reefer and, and say that uh, that's the single most valuable tool that, that I have in my tool chest to, to, to make my, my tank look the way I want it to look and to achieve the goals that I want to have. Um, it's, uh, you know, the oceans have evolved for eons, right? And uh, more, th more so than organisms that are on dry land. Um, and they've had a very stable environment. Um, the oceans are incredibly stable from a, a mineral standpoint and from an elemental com uh, uh, content standpoint. And those organisms have evolved to depend upon that. And um, the more that you can provide a, a comparable environment uh, to the ocean, uh, the better. Um, the one caveat I would add to that is the ocean is a, is a nutrient restricted environment. Um, so, depending on who you ask, um, uh, many will say that iron is the limiting factor in the ocean. So, uh, I wouldn't necessarily advise that you strive to replicate the ocean, <laughs> but um, that should be the minimum bar. My, my understanding, know. the reason it is so, uh, so limited is because there's so many resources sucking up the... There are, there's a lot of, there's a lot of resources there, but it's also, um, you know, life tends to evolve to to grow or expand to the maximum extent of the resources that are available. All living organisms do that. If you plant a plant, it's going to grow as fast and as large as the, as the surrounding source of, of light and nutrients in the soil will allow it. I want a caveat because I've heard this so many times recently. That doesn't mean if you buy a fish this big and you yeah. put it in a 10 gallon <laughs> tank, the fish is going to stay like that. Yeah. <laughs> if you buy a bass and you put it in a 10 gallon tank, the bass is still going to grow to whatever grow. size. That's right. Yeah, as quickly as he can based <laughs> you on what you're feeding. <laughs> So just keep that in mind. Um, you know the iron levels that that we recommend for um, for uh, aquaculture systems or closed systems are much higher than what the ocean is. Um, we recommend same thing with zinc and vanadium and manganese. Um, so our, our recommendations are not necessarily based on what you find uh, in the ocean. If you want to be a purist and you're just and th and that's your your goal is to replicate the ocean, then absolutely. But um, if your goals are to have fantastic coloration or rapid growth, um, there is some benefit to, um, to achieving some levels that are, that are higher than, than what's in the natural ocean. And that's something that, that um, I wanted to mention because I just don't hear it talked about. Most, most of what you hear talked about is try to replicate the ocean, but um, we found that there's lots of benefit in elevating. Replicate to a degree. Yeah, that's right. Make sure you hit the minimums, you, know, you treat that as your minimums, 
but there, there's a lot of gain to be had by um, experimenting with those numbers and within reason, of course. I mean, and, and our recommendations are are based upon what we ourselves have observed and also what we see with our with our customer systems as well too. So we're really focused on on trying to let you get the most that you can get out of that that system, not just the, the bare minimum. I'm going to let you get the last word, but before I do, I got one more question. Sure. Have you considered doing like a subscription program? Like if I wanted to, you know, like I like I like to send mine out sure. monthly. Yeah. Is there something that you, a program that you can get onto like that? Is there something that you're working on? We've considered it, and it's um, it's come up certainly more than once, and um, it is something that um, you know we've talked about. And we'd like to try and solve. Um, one of the things that um, you know that impacts us, of course, is we want to focus on getting the best results we can. We want to focus on the best customer service that we can deliver, and we want to focus on getting results back as, as quickly as, as, as possible. So those are our objectives as a business, and we put as much resources as we can into, into achieving those. Um, when you start, um, fulfillment and all of those types of things can, can often take away resources from 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 doing um, you know those those three objectives that we have, so we're very careful about um, those types of changes because we don't want to lose our focus and we don't want to take away resources that we can be dedicating to those three things. So it is something we're we're looking at and we would like to be able to solve and we'd like to be able to provide some more flexible options. Um, we just have to figure out um, you know how to go about doing it. And a subscription model is a little bit um, uh, tricky because we chose to work through distribution channels. Uh, specifically for that reason, because uh, it, there are lots of people who do that better than, than we would ever be able and, to do. Hey, that's great. Support yeah. the local fish stores in that that's case. That's right. Yes. Exactly. And uh, we want to continue to do that because uh, we want to do what we're, we're good at and we want to you know, let everybody else do what they excel at. But that said, that, it doesn't mean it's impossible to do a subscription service. We just have to, to figure out the right way to, right time to do it and the right way to do it. So that we hey, that's a good answer. Things. Yeah. And I am going to give you the final word, but before that, if you guys have a local fish store that does not carry this yet, talk to the owner, talk to the manager, and mm -hmm. ask them to carry this. This is a great product. I, I mean, I, I only live about 10 or 15 minutes away. Uh, I didn't tell you this earlier, but I sent out a test last Monday, and I got it back on Wednesday. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the turnaround time, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, if I had sent that to Germany, it would have been, been like yeah, a month later. Month but, later. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I do live local. But, yeah. you know, just shows how quickly, because you guys yeah. received it on Tuesday, and the answer was there on Wednesday. Right. So even if it had taken a few days to get to you, yeah. I got my results in 24 hours once it was in your hands. Yeah. So, final words. Final words uh, would just be that, um, just to let, let you know that um, we do have kits available through a number of channels. Um, there are many local fish stores. We have a finder on our website you can go to and you can see if you've got a, a local fish store near you that carries it. Uh, you can get our kits on saltwateraquarium.com. You can also get them from uh, Aquaholics Aquaculture. Um, if you're a local fish store and you want to carry them, uh, talk to ACI Aquaculture. They're our, our exclusive distribution channel and they'll be happy to uh, get you set up to get the kits. And of course, they also have the best coral that you can buy anywhere in the United States. So, <laughs> Chris, you're getting some free publicity here. That means I should be able to come there and do a video with you at some point, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> you know, uh, just backdoor my way That's in. That's right, there. go for you it. Know, <laughs> but uh, name dropping. Yeah. Um, so thank you for, for allowing me to come here and talk about this. My and. Pleasure. I, I'm going to take a little walk around the, the place here, and uh, we'd you, know, love you can tell me, tell me about the different machines and stuff that you have here, and, and uh, we'll, we'll share everything that we can with our viewers. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for, for coming. Appreciate Thank you so it. much. Yeah, you're welcome.